Greetings, travelers, and welcome back to the G2 Esports Class Legends. Uh, we have just seen AK Wonder take a pretty clean series over Mark Kennedy, who probably showed a little bit of his, his Hearthstone inexperience overall, but we are about to jump from that straight into two absolute heavyweights of the Hearthstone scene. We have uh, my complexity teammate, Super JJ, going up against Hoy, who was proving himself to be one of the most consistent players towards the end of uh, 2015. Yeah, so. definitely true. Like, we all remember what he was doing during Jefinity uh, tournaments. He was really cons consistently playing at the top level. And there's a reason why he was recruited into Navi, right? Yeah. And uh, alongside Oskaka and Xixo, which they kind of share the same um, the same feat, which is consistency, right? Yeah. They are being known for making the results in overall. They may not be winning like the, the tournaments, but they do it anyway. But they are always in the top. So that's that's a feat that most of the players thrive to have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hoy, a great deal of consistency. Gfinity results, like you said, he went deep in DreamHack. He was went really deep in the EU qualifiers for BlizzCon last year as well. I think it was one game making it to, uh, to the top eight, I believe. Oh. Uh, I think defeated by 6-0. I think it was a team kill. I, I can't exactly remember the situation, but wow, we are in fact straight into the game here. Didn't he even have a chance to enlighten you about the, the classes? We have got Rogue up against Druid, which is what I predict, uh, predicted. Hoy is a notorious Druid player and Super JJ, in fact, a very much a Rogue Loyalist. And there is this thing with Rogue Loyalists where they are very, very stubborn about Rogue. They, <laughs> they seem to believe that Rogue wins every matchup and the only reason everyone loses yeah. is because they're bad at Rogue. And so yeah, no, no great surprise. Super JJ, very, very experienced Rogue player and there definitely is an element of pride that comes with being a Rogue player. So no huge surprise to see him leading with Rogue. Here. It's very interesting what it pointed out that every Rogue player seems to be in an advantage in every single matchup. Yeah. When, when we talk with them about it, it's like, yeah, of course Rogue is favored, favored in this particular matchup. Then you ask about free order, and it seems like they're favored in every single matchup, so yep. something doesn't add up. Uh, but at the same time, Rogue is capable of winning almost every single matchup. Right. So I mean, and, like, it's it's kind of a joke, like it's kind of a meme, that whole thing, but there is a, an element of reality to it, because Rogue, like, I'm not necessarily going to call it the hardest deck to play, but it's probably the, the deck with the, the biggest gap between the skill floor and the skill ceiling. Mm -hmm. Right, like mm -hmm. you can play rogue abominably badly, and you can play it incredibly well, and the level of variance in your results between those two things are like higher than they are with any other class. It so was that... even even more divided when the old miracle rogue was. Right. There. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's definitely that kind of aspect where, sure, really good rogue players will experience significantly better win rates than say a good secret paladin player and a bad secret paladin player. Like there will be an edge there to the good secret paladin player, but only a small edge. Yep. Whereas with the rogue player, the, the edge is astronomical. So you can kind of understand that attitude. Um, but you know, generally matching up rogue against druid here, how do you feel about that? Ah, <sighs> Now, if you want to win with a rogue against a druid, then you have to pull all the weight to the minions instead of your spells. The spells are a backup plan. Yep. And without having board control in the form of your Farseer's agents, and Azure Drakes and the new inclusion in the Rogue, which is Tomb Pillagers, because that is, that's basically the minions you, you are playing in, the, in your deck. You have a really hard time dealing with with, with, uh, with basically what are what is staring at you from uh, Rogue from sorry from Druid perspective, right? So um, it's very it's very important for Super JJ to have those minions on board. Uh, sorry, to have the minions in hand because without them, he will be certainly. Uh, uh, facing a very hard situation to deal with. But now, he has an option to deal with every single thing that will be just crashing down um, from Druid's side, right? Because now he, he has the... Uh, he has the backstab Eviscerate combo to kill Dr. Boom. He generates 1-1 minions, which are great if there's no swipe, and will play around the bombs. And this is something he wanted to have in the first place. 
Yeah, that, that Violet Teacher draw was huge. He already had a great turn with uh, Backstab plus Eviscerate on the Dr. Boom plus the Tomb Pillager. Mm -hmm. But drawing the Violet Teacher there makes the, the play even more effective because, like you say, he now has a little bit of insurance against those Boom Bots going off and causing absolute havoc. Um, anytime you, you have a board that's like two four health minions facing down two Boom Bots, you feel like you know what's about to happen, right? So yep. now just like generating these extra minions on board, reducing the odds of good boom bots definitely uh, plays into his favor a little bit. True. Uh, oh, I forgot to change the name of the title. Change that. Super JJ versus Holly. There we go. Update. And I guess you have to play the boom bots first. You would like to kill the Azure Drakes, but uh, there's an unwritten rule that one of the boom bots will deal four damage to the Azure Drake each single time. There's like 60% chance of that happening every time. 60% <laughs> of the time it happens every time, is exactly. what you're saying, right? Yeah, okay. So yeah, it looks like he's gonna hero power down a 1-1 one -one first. So it looks like he's just gonna drop through to the claw after this, and he's gonna Ooh. try and maximize his chances of hitting the relevant minions. Um, so I guess he's gonna hit into the prey. Oh, so close. So close, yeah. So now he's... Now he has to play the Shade of Alexandre and be inefficient with his mana. Yeah. Wow. Well, that yeah. was that, that was kind of high risk, high reward with the bombs. I was thinking maybe about not using the hero power first to see if the bomb will hit uh, the bigger minions. Anyway, it's a 66% chance to hit the bigger minions, right? Right. And if you have a smaller damage than needed, then you can finish um, finish the the bigger the bigger minion off with your hero power. Instead yeah. of killing the one one, right? Yeah. But it it was a high risk, high reward play, so I'm not blaming him him for taking that risk. And I think Howie is one of the players that is doing that stuff a lot, mm -hmm. taking those chances. Oh yeah, it makes like Hoy is one of the the best players in the game at, at understanding these sorts of calculated risks. You know, recognizing when he's behind and you know has to make what is you know technically an inefficient play but something that he needs to you know rely on a, a little bit of variance to come out on his way you know knows when to ride his luck when he's behind to potentially steal a game from nowhere he's one of the absolute best at recognizing those sorts of situations but even if he tries extremely hard here he's gonna struggle to to find a line that that comes out ahead on this on this board he may be forced even to just druid of the claw charge into that violet teacher to prevent it from oh. picking up any value that's awful by the way, yep. charging the, with the minion is actually great because you play around backstab. Oh, never mind. Yeah, uh, yeah, you don't play around backstab. But uh, I mean, hmm. Uh, I mean, that's your yeah. way to, of winning. The, uh, sorry, of winning the game. I guess it is. Yeah, I, I'd said that, but yeah, this is definitely a way that he can win if if Rogue does not draw the damage over the next couple of turns. He's definitely able to try and force this game out. Force of Nature's Savage Draw on the following turn is just going to be enough damage to finish the game. That's a very good point. I mean, uh, that was a very good move from Howie. That's his only out to win the game. And he recognized that uh, immediately. So now, Force of Nature or bust? Nope. Doesn't get it. Had two outs in his deck. So yeah, like I said, he, he searched hard for his, his way of winning the game there. He found it in the end, but uh, uh... that, I believe, is gonna be lethal no matter what he does well he can silence edvin kill edvin yeah and that's still 12 13 damage staring at him yeah so and... he can silence edwin hero power the one one and then like trade and living roots into the five four then that's six nine yeah i mean he's alive in that situation but he's never winning the game in that situation so seems unlikely yep well, that's about it. There's, I mean, is there a way to be alive? You have to trade with the Shadow of the Next Chambers, but then you can't win. Yeah, exactly. So you, you well, start, sorry, start sorry. The you can actually win if you will draw these Force of Nature next turn anyway. Uh, but this, uh, in that situation, you will use it to trade, and maybe right, Rogue see. will with next turn. Oh. Yeah. Never mind. Uh, so yeah, it's complexity. Super JJ goes out to a 1-0 game lead here, uh, validating a little bit of his faith in Rogue so far. And Hoy is going to have the option here, see if he's choosing to switch his deck. It seems unlikely because 
there isn't going to be that much variation in rogue decks, right? Like whether it's uh, a Malagos Miracle type build or an oil build, like the core wait, of wait, the wait. deck is still the same. So JJ probably. won, right? So he sticks with it. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, oh, uh, okay. What I'm saying is like Hoy's option to change will probably not be taken because mm -hmm. he knows that there isn't much variation in rogue, right? So yeah, he will, he will have picked the tech the deck to start with that he feels strong against just the general rogue archetype. So it seems unlikely That's that true. he'll then switch up his deck based on on um yeah, but but it seems unlikely that he will have missed his first matchup and now switched to the other deck is what I'm saying. But wouldn't we um that would mean that he's not playing aggro druid, right? Because aggro druid is kind of favorite against rogue, I guess, because there are no tones. Almost no tones apart from a single belcher maybe. Yeah, but I mean, Rogue is very efficient at, at picking apart um, very, very small minions with, with things like Fan of Knives, Backstab, etc. So they can answer the early boards very efficiently, and then things like Fel Reaver just get sapped immediately. So mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. can be an uphill battle even for that deck. I think uh, the matchups between the two Druid builds against um, against Rogue are probably fairly even. I know Hoy definitely feels more comfortable as just a standard mid-range Druid player, so not hugely surprised to just see him continuing down this line and uh, picking up the mid-range deck again. True. Well, uh, now let's see the mulligans. I would say JJ should mulligan away everything because he thrives for those free free minions as soon as possible. And for Howie, I would say you just leave the Palter Shutter. Wow, he actually keeps lower third. Interesting. Cause... Yeah, I mean, very very effective card against Rogue, of course. But keeping it in your opening hand with uh, with no guarantee of ramp and. You know, no, no shade of Max Ramos at that point either. He is fortunate enough to pick one up. Definitely a risky mulligan, but as we said, Hoy not not adverse to taking the odd risk here and there. Yeah, I was just thinking that if you are a druid player, you mulligan away every single spell, unless it's a backstab, and you have an agent already or a Azure Drake in hand. Or mm. a Thalnos. Uh, right? I think he would keep uh, preparation in this matchup as well. When he's going first? I think so. Yeah, I think prep is just such an incredibly swingy card in most matchups. I, when I when I play rogue these days, there's very few matchups that'll throw away a prep in. I just think it's okay. insanely swingy. Uh, it does depend on the particular build, though. We see an assassin's blade in this list, which is kind of interesting. But obviously, if you're playing like a more uh, Gadgetan auctioneer Malagos kind of focused deck, then the preparations are more valuable late. You don't really want to use them early. And we see, wow, Hoy does in fact have Harrison Jones in this build as well. So no surprise that he's chosen to stick with this deck. Yeah, now it's. Yeah. Now it's all clear why he'd stick to this deck. The, the single Harrison Jones can be matter of life and death in this matchup. Okay, so he can choose to just straight up swipe down this Tomb Pillager, or he can just coin out essentially a five mana Ancient of Lore here to pick up two cards straight away. Mm, would you do it? Because probably like there's a, there's a question uh, when 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 you exactly play Harrison Jones, Harrison yep. Jones because usually. Rogue will use the Deadly Poison or Oil the same turn he will use Blade Flow. Right. So you will not have value from that. So is it maybe better to have immediate draw from the Harrison Jones instead of waiting and whiffing on the Harrison Jones in general? Yeah, I, I think it absolutely is. If I have an opportunity as a, as a Druid player or as a, really as any player against Rogue to, to drop a Harrison just to hit a regular 1-2 dagger, I will take it. But in this situation, like he had a decent play anyway. Um, and using the Harrison there would have used up his coin. And it doesn't look like any charges of this dagger are going to get used anytime soon, right? Like, there's no target on board for him to swing at. So he probably feels like he can still take the Harrison next turn if he wants it. I'm sure he's not expecting this Assassin's Blaze to come into play. Yeah, but not definitely. <laughs> if, if, he, if he does manage to hold on to Harrison for a few more turns and uh, that Assassin's Blade does come out, then he's going to be very, very much rewarded for his, his, his greed there holding on to the Harrison. That's true, but uh, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how. Um, what is the build that Super Jedi uses currently while he's streaming when it comes to the rogue, right? Because maybe how he was doing uh, some research, and maybe JJ is playing with the uh, with the Assassin's Bed and his, you know, standard build, and that might be the reason why the Harrison Jones might not see play yet. Yep, very, very true. That is definitely a possibility. Um, but again, the dagger was used this turn, so it looks like uh, JJ is keeping the threat of Harrison Jones in mind a little bit. He didn't he didn't play around it last turn with the coin, but the, the five mana alert has popped up in his brain here, it looks like, and he does take the swing at face just to reduce the, the pressure of Harrison Jones a little bit. 
And that might be good enough just to see the, the coin emperor come down right here. Oh yeah, the coin emperor is perfect in this situation, I think. Next in for JJ. Well, he's saving the coin for the admin anyway, right? It looks that way, yeah. But it's turn 6 when he can play Assassin's Blade with Deadly Poison and just kill off the Emperor with that. Hmm, interesting. He goes, Hong Hong goes for the for the loader instead. Yeah, I mean, he's continuing to hold on to, to this coin here. It's interesting because he's going to get the huge discount on his hand with the Emperor at some point. So it seems unlikely that he's going to need the coin to accelerate anything. And it's not like he has combo pieces because mm -hmm. normally when you're carrying like Innovate and coin into the late game, that's the sort of thing you're looking at. Like what crazy combo shenanigans can I make happen with these cards? Um, he doesn't have any combo pieces in hand right now. So looks like he's uh, just gone for a little bit of aggression here. And essentially, like, the board has kind of neutrally traded itself for a couple of turns. And he's going to end up playing the Emperor anyway, it looks like. I mean, Hoy might decide something different again. But very, very much looks like an Emperor Thoris on this turn. So, I mean, those two turns have kind of got both players, not really got them anywhere. Uh, Hoy's managed to net a little bit of face damage with the Shade. Um, but we're kind of back where we were in the previous turn, which is, you know, trade the board down, play Emperor. So. Yep, I agree. Seems like the correct um, play this turn because you will, like I said, Druid player, you know that as, um, there, had, uh, there, had, there have to be a lot of commitment to kill a 5-5 five five from, um, from Rogue perspective. It's either a spell power minion plus a Viscerate or a backstab and a Viscerate, right? And he, he already saw one Azure Drake being played. Yeah, for sure. Preparation being picked up here. It's going to allow him to, to cast that sprint a lot more handily, but his his hand is kind of full on resources already, although despite not really having anything proactive to do. And so it looks like we... Ah, oh, he's going to go for the... Wait. I mean, that has to be a prep episode, and yeah. he goes for the 6-6 six, six because he is afraid of Big Game Hunter. Right, exactly. So I was just a little bit curious as the, to the ordering for a second there, but yeah, deliberately playing some cards after the Edwin there so that he can play around exactly oh that guy. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, so very heads up play from JJ, making himself a 6-6. Six, six. Of course, that we there is the double keeper in hand that can, can deal with this almost as effectively as the big game hunter would if it was made bigger, but still strong play here, you know, consolidated board against Druid, and he also managed to clear out a lot of cards from his hand. Uh -huh. uh, which makes that sprint, you know, far more uh, castable in the following turns. Although he did use his prep, which was, you know, would have been his primary method to, to cast the sprint without losing too much tempo. Hmm. You think that double keepers this turn will be an, an option to consider? Uh, so just silence it and then kill it, is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. Not bad. Uh, so if he uses one, he could he could potentially coin out the Harrison alongside the si the silence as his only other play. See, so yeah, I think the silence definitely has to happen, and just kind of by being dictated by what his hand does right now, the, the coin Harrison doesn't feel good here at all. So I think the second keeper does just have to come down, like you say. So looks good. Hmm. Well, it, it it quite looks good for Rogue for now anyway, because he will just um play more minions on board and like backstep this turn, kill the keeper. You saw one, two keepers so you know that the Azure Drake will not get killed from another keeper. Yep. You can clear and heal to 30 and still have 6, 10 attack on board and 8 HP on board, which is very difficult to for Druid to deal with. Yeah, completely agree. Um, and again, ooh. I'm gonna go for the Assassin's Blade ah. line instead. Uh, at least thinking about it, I kind of go with you here. I, I like playing out the minions here first. I think, like, based on his hand, I think the Sprint will definitely be the last card cast from this hand. He'll he'll get rid of everything else first, and then use the Sprint to refill, hoping that all the initiative from these cards gets him far enough ahead that the Sprint will will work without losing him too much initiative. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the best way to start going about doing that is just by playing all your minions this turn. It looks like, yeah, that's that's the line we ended up going down. So. I'm just interested if he kills the uh, Keeper of the Grove or not. I think like you, you should, because you saw the two Keepers already. So you you push your opponent into using a Wrath or Swipe Hero Power or Living Roots. Yeah, Living Roots is a pretty nice pickup there. 
Um, and I think like I think the card draw is a bit too slow at this point. I think he just needs the board presence of Doctor Boom. So you think so? Yeah, I think Doctor Boom <laughs> would be a pretty good play here, as it is in a lot of situations. So Boom Living Roots looks pretty solid here. Hmm. Well, yeah, can't agree. I mean, I can't not agree with you here. That's probably not the correct way you should say that, but um. You have to go for it. The Doctor Boom is just such a huge board presence that now um, JD needs a big game hunter of, of his own. Yes, yeah, it does, it. doesn't get it though. Picks up an eviscerate, so oh. he now has now has the option to sprint this turn if he wants to try and pick up a sap. But no, it looks like he's just going to go for the initiative play here instead. He's gonna slap the deadly poison on the assassin's blade and this lothar is gonna get blown out extremely yes. extremely hard by this harrison jones i'm i'm just making a grin right now because it's it's so <laughs> painful it's almost as painful as watching a doom hammer die but you know when when it happens to a rogue it's probably less satisfying for the twitch chat yep. because you know everyone hates on face shaman <laughs> <laughs> and then people kind of Love the rogue, rogue players. That's the general consensus. Oh, look at that. One into one, which is not that bad because. Yeah. Actually, it's not that bad because there's probably a fan of knives next to him anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that Harrison is devastating. The, the Doomhammer comparison that you made is very real because although you don't draw as many cards, that was a 15 damage weapon that he Harrisoned, whereas, you know, a full blown Doomhammer is, is only 16. And it's usually 12, by the No, wait. Uh, yeah, 12 damage by the time you actually get to Harrison it. So, in terms of total damage removed from the board, that's actually a little bit better than just removing a raw Doomhammer. But mm -hmm. you know, obviously, the eight card draw is a miss. And uh, speaking of misses, Tinker's Sharp Soil Oil is for sure a whiff for JJ this turn. Welp, you play the agent, deal two damage to Harrison Jones, you can kill it next turn with Fan of Knives, but that's about it. If your opponent will be careless, you might even trade with the 5-5 five, five and the 3-3, three, three, but it's probably not gonna happen. Yep, JJ just decides to dagger up though, and still has enough mana, especially with the use of the preparation to do all of those things next turn, so... Um, doesn't see the need to commit right now and just lose his SI agent to the board. Um, but looks like Hoy is going to start off this turn with a wild growth. No, he I wants can't... to get the combo, right? This turn yeah. and just finish the game. Uh, would be lethal, 10 plus 14, 24, 28. Yeah, it would. Okay. So if he hits Force of Nature here, he does just immediately have lethal. Nope. Doesn't get it. Second wild growth cannot draw him Force of Nature, or at least if it does, he won't have the mana to innovate out the combo. So. Just gonna have to go for a sticky minion play here, probably involving the pilot treader, just so he doesn't. Uh, he plays around things like blade flurry and fan of knives to maximum effect. Just try and generate as sticky a board as he possibly can here. No, it looks like he's just gonna continue cycling with the ancient of No, he's gonna heal in fact. Okay. Wow. All right. Hmm. So he's afraid of the blade flurry with oil combo. Yep. Because uh, he doesn't really need card draw when he has so many minions in hand. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, he would definitely love to hit the, the Force of Nature Savage draw combo just to end the game, but as long as he doesn't die, he definitely has the gas in his hand to keep going for as long as he needs to, keep playing minions each turn, so... Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Wait, did he just go for one damage Fen of Knives? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, this now... So we could have just initially called the Fan of Knives a mistake, but as the turn went on, it looks like that was just a concede play from Super yeah, JJ. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, he needed Blade Flurry that turn, right? Yeah. Otherwise, he had no chance of winning this game because if he if he would have Blade Flurry, then he can use the Oil, Falnos, and Blade Flurry to kill all the minions right. and deal eight damage to the face. This is why Hoi healed himself. Just out of, just to be kind of out of range of any shenanigans that can happen after Blade Flow, right? If right. there's like a nice second, an example, a second preparation to build up the board at the same time. Yeah, so even if the worst case scenario comes down there and he does get his board cleared by exactly spell damage Tinker's Flurry, um, 
like you said, he'll he by healing himself, he then has enough health to just continue going, and he has plenty of resources in his hand just to again just play two minions on the following turn, hero power down the blood mage or whatever. So, in retrospect, the the heal play actually made a ton of sense there. Good recognition from Hoy to to pick up the situation of game, realizing that the the heal was appropriate. And okay, Super JJ is staring down at a hand that has Coin Violet Teacher Preparation Sap in it. Oh, it's quite good, I would say. Pretty much the dream against Druid, yeah. Hmm. Well, for Hoi, he has loaded. Did he, did he uh, again keep it in his opening hand? Uh, I didn't see. I think he may have just mulliganed into it. I think it might have been a full mulligan on his part this time, but I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Okay, well, it doesn't look bad either. You have a foul no Sorry, uh, I... Um, a Shade of Nextramus, if you want to risk a Blade, uh, sorry, a Fan of Knives on 10 free, yeah. which is kind of risky, but then your opponent doesn't develop the board, mm -hmm. so you can play the uh, the Shredder on 10 4 and innovate Ancient of Law on 10 5. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in this matchup. Um... Usually, like, equipping a dagger on turn two is just such a good platform for Rogue to build from that they generally do it, like, every turn two ever. Um, but the the two reasons why you generally play Blood Mage are, one, your hand is bad, or two, like, you have Fan of Knives in hand to kill Shade of Next Ramus on curve, as you said. So the very fact that this Blood Mage has come out may just make Hoy a little bit scared of dropping the Shade of Next Ramus here. Yep. That's a very good mind against, by the way, by uh, Super JJ. There's also a valid strategy against Hunters when you drop the Valnos on turn 2, because usually Hunters have a hard way, um, hard time dealing one damage. Oh! 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 Wow! The teacher preparation fan of knives, and that is probably the game. <laughs> Unless there's a swipe top deck. Yeah. Swipe top deck rescues the situation here. It does, for sure. But like, if, if it's just Pilot Shredder coming down, it's just going to get sapped, the dagger is going to come up, and yeah, he's going to be in a world of trouble here. Yeah. This will generate so much board advantage for for JJ. It's impossible to come back, I think. Yeah. Unless, of course, you top deck this fight. But the damage is done. The card advantage is done. The tempo is lost. Because of the sap. Yep. The only glimmer of hope here for Hoy is that uh, Loatheb is able to come down here, and the mana hasn't already been invested in Deadly Poison. He could have chosen to just dagger up Deadly Poison that turn instead of using the sap and just beat the Shredder that way. Um, and since he hasn't done that, he now doesn't have the Deadly Poison equipped. He can't cast it this turn because it's six mana. Um, so this Loatheb is kind of inefficient to deal with. No, all right, he's just going to trade in all of his individual tokens and I guess play yep. heal bot alongside this board. Seems I like that, because yep. the odds of drawing the swipe are increasing each single turn. Mm -hmm. And he, if if the um, Violet Teacher will not die this turn... Oh, look at that. That means you yeah. can still develop the minions the turn after, because you have so many spells right. uh, in your hand. Yep, makes a ton of sense. So we have kind of an awkward innovate Ancient of Law play this turn. He does have two in his hand, so he does need to kind of get them out there on the board as soon as possible. Um, can just replay the Shredder that got sapped before and hope there isn't a decent answer to it. Or he can spend his whole turn swiping a Violet Teacher, which none of these things seem idea. particularly good for him, right? Yeah, but I, I would say that the Ancient of Law would be the best option. Because mm. if you Ancient of Law into Wrath, the next turn looks better. Because you can use the swipe. Actually, it doesn't change anything. No, never mind. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is that you now that you've drawn the swipe, you're a little less scared of that Violet Teacher because you know you can mop up any tokens that are generated in a single turn without too much hassle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a, probably a compelling enough argument here to go for the Ancient of Law. Picks up two cards. Uh, he does get the rat, so he does have a little more, a little more uh, clearing flexibility now if he wants to. But that Tomb Pillager is a pretty nice draw here. Oh, uh, well, actually, doesn't quite fit with the mana. Yeah, he'd, yeah. Like, he'd like to play Tomb Pillager, dagger up, and eviscerate. But if only he would have not attacked face with with the dagger on turn four, because he would have still had one durability that could have been used right. with the eviscerate this turn. Yeah. That would be perfect, but in this situation, I guess you need to... 
dagger up, deadly poison. Nah, makes a sense. You need to sacrifice the the, uh, the high bot, the heal bot. Sorry. Looks like he's just going face. I can't oh. really, I can't really oh. object to this play either. I don't see anything wrong with this, to be honest. He hasn't seen the swipe so far. Obviously, it can have been drawn since the last time he established he didn't have it for sure. Well, there were um, four drops, right? Right, exactly. It's a ton of draws. So, you know, he can definitely have the swipe in his range at this point, but even swipe isn't really enough to deal with this entire board. And if even the slightest, like, fragment of a board remains, then the, the deadly poison tinker oil follow-up is just going to be comfortably lethal. True, and um, let's count the damage. So if if Hall will play the swipe and he has to this turn, then he's leaving nothing on board, and um, JJ can deal six damage. So he needs eviscerate or no, or blade flurry. But that's not it. So what about sprint this turn? Um, I think we. I think I'd rather just deal the six this turn anyway. Just do the the deadly mm -hmm, poison mm -hmm. tinkers turn, and then next turn you can sprint and you have uh, the coin for things like blade flurry, eviscerate, sap, you know, anything like that that you might need to be able to deal the lethal damage with the the remaining dagger charge. Yeah, that's a good point because then you have more outs to actually kill your opponent next turn. Yeah. After the sprint. Yep. Very good point. Oh. So JJ disagrees. He's going to go for the sprint right now. Um, so... This this does just slow down your win condition by a little bit. Um, you, you're now going to have to find a couple of turns to like generate all the value out of this stuff on the turn. And in the meantime, like the the druid is more than capable of like threatening to kill you with a with a force of nature savage roar on the backswing. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it also makes Hoi kind of intimidated to play Druid of the Claw in taunt mode because there's a huge chance now there's a sap in the hand, and if there's a sap and an agent then you're in a, in a world of troubles. So in this situation, I wouldn't blame him to just play Engine of Law and heal himself. Yeah, it definitely seems like a reasonable line. Uh, one sap has, of course, been used on that Shredder after the initial really, really swingy turn with the Prep Fan of Nides. But yeah. after drawing so many cards, he's, he's well in within his rights to have the second sap in hand right now. Um, but again, Hoy might just be looking to to try and identify some line where he's threatening lethal himself. He does have two Druid of the Claws that he can charge, you know, one of which he can pair with a Savage Roar if he'd like to. Um, so there is the option to go aggressive here if he'd like to try and race the Rogue from this position. But looks like he's just going to go for the, the the safe play again. Second time in this series now we've seen him healing with Ancient of Law. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like that. Uh, yeah, I like it too. So now for, for Super JJ... It's probably the turn when you need to drop low tip so not to die next turn. Class. Oh, he seems to disagree, so that will be a full clear with Eviscerate and Agent. I was uh, thinking about, about the low tip because you would like to have the Eviscerate to finish off the game, right? Because yeah. it's additional damage to the face. Yeah, for sure. But I guess after the, the, the second law comes down to heal, he's uh, accepted the fact that he's he has to react to the, the board again now and just build mm -hmm, up a board mm -hmm. presence. Um, and I guess that's the merit of going his line with the sprint, is that he can use that one turn to like react to what his opponent is going to do. Um, whereas the more aggressive line that I was looking at, you're kind of all in on that winning the game with face damage strategy. And if it doesn't work out, like you've used so many of your resources to go down that line, which doesn't pay off. Um, so I guess the sprint the sprint plan does allow JJ to kind of evaluate what the next turn is, work out whether he needs to try and build a board again. And he's he's looked at the situation here, judges that he does need to start fighting for the board once again, and now has a, a very sizable board presence once again, and, and lower there in hand to back this up on a following turn if he needs it. Yep, true. And there's still one preparation in the deck and one blade flurry, right? Because he used... No, wait, actually he didn't use blade flurry yet. But I'm not sure how many Blade Flurs Super JJ is actually playing. I would say it's two because you played double poisons and probably double oils. Yeah, the weird thing is though, I don't think we've seen a single one be drawn yet in any of the games, right? I don't remember him having a Blade Flurry in hand at any point. I might be wrong. Mm, uh, I, I don't think so. No. So yeah, but I, I mean, I'm with you. I'd expect him to be playing two. It would be very, very unusual for him to be only playing one. Um, but yeah, very, very like strange quirk that we haven't seen one being drawn yet. 
Um, he's going to have to find a way to navigate through this board. This looks well, like a solid lower third turn. Or does he just have lethal? That's six damage to the Droid of the Claw with the minions, and you have three. Um, well, you can't kill your own. Uh, you can't kill your own Violet Teacher Violet to teacher. have a certain uh, way of pushing the buff on your minion that can attack. So it seems like you might just use, um, yeah, just this, just clear with the one ones, and yep. push for more board control. You you know that your opponent can't use combo next turn, so pushing for free damage instead of trading, of course, makes more sense. Should that should be it? That should lock the game for the next turn because even though. Yeah, there's no way. There's no way Hoi can can trade with every single minion, clear the board, and put a taunt. Yeah, I don't see it. And also a benefit this time. So if he does play Drew of the Claw to taunt uh, this time, because the Violet Teacher is at four health, he can trade it off to guarantee that the tokens don't spawn and get buffed by the oil. So he will have the guaranteed oil buff on the following turn, um, and that is going to be more than enough damage to to clutch out this game. Yep. Oh, Hunter Creeper's not bad, but that, that's actually not that helpful in a situation like this, when you're on brink of dying. Mm -hmm. Time waits for no one. There was no sap last turn, so how oh, he needs to go with the Druid of the Claw in taunt mode, I guess. Very true. Um, does he have, actually have enough damage? So he trades in the 3-4 the and the 3-3. Three, three. Dagger up, Deadly Poison is 3. Tinker's Oil adds 6. So yeah, I think he has exact lethal, right? It's exactly um, 12. Sacrifice Violet Teacher, you have yep. 6, you have four, 6 and 7, 10, 16 damage. No, I can't do, six, uh, six, 13 damage. 13, 13 damage. Okay. Wait. Wait, what? Am I missing something? No, I don't think so. So, okay, Violet Teacher trades in, SI7 Agent trades in. You dagger up, you deadly poison, so you have 6 damage total, and then Tinker's Oil adds another 6. It's 12. I'm pretty sure it's exactly 12. Oh, no, I'm confused. That was yeah. lethal, right? I'm I'm 99% sure that was lethal, yeah. Wow. Oh, well. that that was surprising. <laughs> yeah. Now anyway, let's go on it and let's see how what can uh, JJ do now because now he needs to trade with the minions and use the backstep too. So he will have to sacrifice one of the free trees, use the agent to clear uh, with the door to the claw. But does that... Would that uh, be lethal for eight, um, 18, 19, 22? No, two off lethal with uh, with combo. Yeah. So that was not even close. So he will probably win anyway. But I'm kind of surprised. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, re it's really easy to count, right? Because, like, Tinker's Oil is a fireball if you have a minion in play. The four da it's six damage for four mana. Yeah. So he would have been left over with a 3-3 on the board after trading. He would have had a Deadly Poison Dagger up, which is three more damage. So that's six total, plus the six from the Tinker's Oil is 12. It's just lethal, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and now Howie will try to... Fish for another swipe, I guess. Yep, swipe is what he needs, but it's probably just not going to be good enough here, even if he gets it. So much damage able to come back now that that Blade Flurry is in hand as well, but he's going to try his best just to reduce the damage on board, make the Rogue have something, but the Rogue has plenty here. here we, have, we have Deadly Poison, we have Tinker's Oil, we have Blade Flurry. I don't think there's any chance that we don't achieve lethal here. Well, it's the single Deadly Poison and Blade Flurry yeah. does. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Like, do whatever you want, basically. I think there was also a fan of knives this yeah. time. Yeah. Yep. Very much look that way. You, you can't. You can't resist, right? Just tidying. Oh up. no! No be no. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that ties up the third game of the match. It's three-one for Super J. Eh, sorry, two-one for Super yeah. JJ. And I guess how you will. Again, not switch because of the Harrison Jones that he has in this in this deck, mm -hmm. and now he knows there's a Assassin's Blade, so they're queuing up immediately with the same decks. It's a very interesting situation this format that the players are not entirely 
prepared for certain matchups, right? Yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's something we saw in uh, you know the left half of the bracket as you look at it. The games over that side tend to be more uh, back and forth and counter picking and people with tech choices and yeah. widely varied um, class choices. But as we've moved over to the right hand side of the bracket, um, the players seem to just have um, picked one deck that they're really, really solid and consistent with and they tend to be just riding that out as, as best they can. So It seems like the deck, for, um, like an example, the Druids, the Midrand Druids, are now having the Harrison Jones built in. Yeah. So it's like a default option against class with weapons. So the other Druid that is not so good overall, it's just not a better option. Even if it might be aggressive, it's just not a better option to play instead of a Midrand Druid. I don't know if that made sense, but it seems like the case here. Mm. So... Preparation doesn't really have a good enough spell to go with it in order to help him clear this bear out, so probably just going to have to uh, suck it up and play a 3-3 onto the board here and just hope that the combination of that 3-3 and the deadly poison on the following turn is enough to deal with this 4-6. Yep, unfortunately that's the case. Next turn at least he can deal with the with the door to the claw unless there will be a wrath. Fortunately for him there's no wrath to deal with the free free so uh, the Innervate will practically make make a trade 2 for 2, but it will deal 4 damage. So, yep. it's not that bad for, for Silver JG, to be honest. Could have no, been worse. Not. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen Innervates do much worse things to people than, than what's happened here. And honestly, Rogue is, is one of the best classes of the game, uh, in the game, sorry, at dealing with this kind of situation. You know, Sap, Backstab, Eviscerate, like all these cards are so efficient for their mana cost. That they can just trade up into four and five drops really, really easily. Um, so yeah, Rogue, Rogue's pretty well equipped to deal with the innovate plays. It's one of the reasons why Rogue players feel comfortable in this matchup. Although, as we already discussed, Rogue players feel comfortable in every matchup. So, and I mean, they have to be afraid of Contra Warrior, right? Yeah, uh, but I like. I, I believe Mr. Yagoot thinks that he wins that matchup. So, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Dude. Okay. Like, rogue players. They live in a world of their own. <laughs> <laughs> so there has to be turned with um, deadly poison agent. Is it? Uh, that looks like. Oh, it's oh yeah. Yeah, prep fan SI agent deadly poison is a board clear here. Yeah, this guy's so it looks like that's what we're going for. Yeah, she takes significantly less damage as well. She gets to attack the two attack minion instead of the bear. And swings the board completely from being two minions behind to one minion ahead, which is exactly the kind of thing that Druid hates dealing with. Okay, I was just thinking that if you keep the prep, it will matter a lot if you top deck a um, two cards basically a sprint and a sap, mm -hmm. three cards, and um, an eviscerate. Bank leaf as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, it turns out prep's a good card and it's really useful in a lot of situations, but uh, I think JJ is just going to follow this tempo line here. He's he's made his one play to swing the board, so now he's just going to do everything he can to keep ahead of the board. Playing the Blade Flurry there essentially just as a combo activator. He did get a little bit of damage to face that he would have got otherwise, but only hitting one minion, so hardly an AoE effect. But this kind of board is just what Druid hates to deal with. Like, three health things on board, it resists swipe, it resists uh, force of nature, you mm -hmm. know, you can, only, you can only shoot one of them with wrath, so... <laughs> this, this kind of, like, irritating board state is just something that they really do hate to deal with, and it looks like Hoyt is gonna go for the full clear here with uh, perhaps the Innovate Hero Power as well. I think so, yep. because he has a good turn 7 um, play, so that actually deals with the board. Right. Um, fortunately for Super JJ, he has a way of placing something on the board and still having the same um, the same amount of cards in his hand. So, oh, is that better? No, you have to go for the Azure Drake, right? I mean, because it's turn seven, your opponent will drop either a Doctor Boom or yep. a Ancient of Law. Yeah. I mean, there is an argument to say that you know, if it's Ancient of Law, then having the lower Feb in play just to trade cleanly is a thing but you know lurth such a high value card against druid because of that one free turn it can buy you late on and since this is a matchup where people are generally just racing for tempo a lot that one free turn that lower can buy you at the end of the game just can be any can be everything for either class to get to drop it 
Oh, that Tomb Pillager was crucial. <laughs> it really was, yeah. Like, of course, you you go for the backstab fan of knives anyway, but finding a minion that you can play after that turn, uh, sorry, after that play, that fills out the curve, was crucial to maintain still the board control. So that was awesome. Yeah, for sure. And again, Hoy is, is sat here with a ton of cards in hand, a ton of resources at his d disposal, but he's, he's sat so far behind on tempo right now. A little bit awkward. He is just going to go for the double shredder play, try and contest the board, but Sap is going to take one of these out nicely, and Eviscerate is another option. He's probably just going to Sap yeah, one and go sap. face it. Yeah. Yeah. Sap and sap go face. face. Exactly. Because now we have a range of attack, uh, sorry, a range of damage that we should just seal the deal for the next turn, and you know that your opponent has one useless card in his, in his hand from yep. six cards available, and every other spell is also useless because even if he has a swipe he's able to kill one minion you can trade with the other minion and that still leaves four damage on board which when it's paired up with the eviscerate is lethal anyway because you have dagger up and the eviscerate deals four damage or maybe five if there's the yeah, still azure drake on board i mean it's the same outcome if you kill loaded or azure drake there's a difference here mm -hmm. so it looks very much like Super JJ is about to take this series down. Unless Hoy can find something magical here to dig his way out of this. He's looking, taking his time, assessing all his options, but I think he's going to come to the conclusion that he's in trouble here. Gonna go for the Shredder draw swipe to take out two minions of his choosing. But as you said, as long as a card comes out that it's possible to combo the Eviscerate with, which is everything. Well. <laughs> it's going to be lethal either way here. And there you yeah. go, that'll do. There we go. Is there anything that couldn't be a part of the combo? I don't think so. The most expensive card he may be playing in his deck is Dr. Boom. He could have comboed that. So, yeah, seems yeah. unlikely. Yeah, and that's it. Super JJ takes the game against Howie. So Rogue, favorite, of course, against Druid, and wins 3-1. Howie is knocked out, out of the tournament because it's a single elimination and will be left with the last match of the day, which will be the winner of that game, will be facing JJ tomorrow. And the last pair is between oh, Orange, Orange and, and Gara. Gara. So the Temple Storm Alcan rivalry at the end of the day. Uh, end of the day. And um, I didn't see Gara for a long time playing in the tournament, and, uh, but I like his deck building skills. So I hope right. that he is bringing something interesting. Yeah. Uh, to this new format, right? So, hopefully, yeah, Gara, maybe Gara Shaman. Little, yeah, maybe Shaman. Gara, notorious one for being uh, the best Shaman, and also notorious for putting those little twists into decks that this format seems to reward a little bit. Um, but yeah, great great series of games so far. Um, if you guys have anything to say about it, you can feel free to tweet using the hashtag GT, G2CL. <laughs> yeah, just got, just right. about got there. I'm starting to see a little bit of repetition coming up along the ticker at the bottom there. So let's get some new tweets coming to, to get in there. Um, so if you guys have any thoughts about the upcoming match, anything that you've seen, or uh, you know, even ideas and suggestions for how Lothar can adjust this format in the future, I'm sure he'd be willing to listen to those as well. That would be great. Yeah, so um, in the meantime, it looks like we are ready to take a very short break, and we will be back shortly with Orange versus Gara right after this. Don't go anywhere.